bienvenidos de vuelta y a nuestra última charla de hoy. Con nosotros estamos con Lori en tienda. Y para los que necesitan traducción, recuerden que tenemos una, un canal de traducción en Pine. Welcome, Lori. Lori Ross O'Neill is a cybersecurity researcher, technical project manager, and cybersecurity team leader at the Pacific Northwest Research Projects. Her teams work in partnership with government agencies, academia, and industry to perform research and development to deliver innovative and novel. And prior to, co to coming to PNLL, Mrs. O'Neill worked at NASA as an aerospace engineer supporting the space shuttle and other flight programs. She's, a, she's passionate about mentoring and educating in cybersecurity. Welcome, Lori. Thank you for being with us today. It's Honor and an honor for us to have you here. Wonderful, thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Today, I'm going to let cyber. Life. Five myths about cyber protections of control systems. And I'm going to focus on a case study of work I did with the United States Army uh, for their renewable installations, and then some lessons learned from this effort that you could implement into your procurement language. And finally, some resources that you can have access to to help you pursue this, um, this topic as well. So Lisa, did I, I'm going to go ahead and skip this slide and go to the next one. So here in the United States, the Department of Energy has seven. Uh, here's a picture of how we fit into the state of Washington. And our goal is really to focus on science and technology capabilities for the Department of Energy and to drive collaboration uh, to solve these hard problems. So I'm going to start out with a case study of how a cyber attack had a physical outcome. Back in 2014, a spear phishing email was sent to a German store able to that then transferred over to the furnace network and control the furnace of the steel mill and actually cause it to overheat and damage the steel mill. So this is a very, what could maybe have been done differently or better if the contract had included some cybersecurity language to protect a future attack. Okay, covers the, the stages that I will cover in my presentation. So planning for your procurement, what are the requirements for the procurement? How will you select and evaluate these submissions from vendors? Awarding the contract, and then the largest piece of it is really managing the contract itself. So I have a note here. It says, what if the contract is a lifespan of 20 to these big control system installations may last for 20 or 30 years? For example, installing a substation or a heating and cooling system or an electric dam. And our planning is who might want to
business make it difficult to function. This is for their own personal gain or in this day and age, embarrassing. or even how the public sees the organization itself and their trust in it. So these are just some of the motivations an attacker may have. And in the planning stages of the contract, we need to think about these. What are we protecting against and how can we best do that? So the work that I'm going to talk about today came about from some um, work we did for the U.S. Army Office of Energy Initiatives. So they were formed back in 2014, and their goal was to bring about renewable energy on U.S. Army bases. So this is a picture of where those bases are in the U.S. and what type of renewables each installation was, was expected to have. So they may have been wind, solar, uh, those are some of the type of renewables that each site would have. And this is their goals that they had for the site. Um, so the goal of this effort was really to include cybersecurity requirements in contracts and agreements to protect protect the Army over the life of these renewable energy um, assets. So how did we do that? So it's important to think that from the contractor's perspective, uh, these risks might not be particularly important to them, but definitely to the base or the installation, this is very important. So we want to look into some myths, if you will, about cybersecurity. So one of the questions we heard a lot was, well, isn't it going to cost a lot of money to add to this contract? It might, but building it in at the beginning is always going to be much cheaper than trying to mitigate an attack or uh, recover from it later on. For example, with the German steel mill, recovering from a physical explosion and the shutdown of their plant is much more expensive than if they had been able to put the security controls in at the beginning. Energy systems, hard to figure out and, and protect. Well, it used to be when they were very proprietary, that was the case. But many of these systems are now using common operating systems like Windows and Linux. Um,
assume there's no connectedness anymore. There's so much being connected and finding all those connections can be a challenge. One of the other myths we heard is, aren't there already protections in place? Well, personally, I actually had my, through their heating and cooling vendor, was able to connect in to the um, business network. And so it then released personal information about shoppers. So while you hope there is on the vendor to protect themselves, and finally, the question is, aren't there already requirements in place for utilities? So here in the US, we have the North American Electric Liability Corporation, which is doing a great job of focusing on safety and cybersecurity, would not fall under this requirement. Um, as well as um, they focus on the protection of the substation and the grid. They're not focusing on the protection of the consumer. So we really needed to take the consumer's view and how to protect the consumer in this case of the energy received. So what we did as we were developing requirements is scenarios or use cases, if you will, that could be considered for this work. And we came up with two possible scenarios that vendors might propose or could be used at various installations. One of the first ones is if the power is purchased directly from the utility. For example, the utility has a renewable power source such as solar or uh, wind, and they purchase, the Army purchases their power just like uh, maybe you receive power at your own home or business. It's, it's no special requirement for the Army. It's not connected to the Army's network or their devices. And really the Army is treated like any other customer. So in this case, the utility's internal cybersecurity program applies, but it may not be secure enough. For example, maybe the Army's data, just like your data, is being uploaded to the cloud. And that data maybe is available to others that access to that data. Um, and by looking at, say, their energy consumption, somebody could infer what goes on at that installation or what the mission is. Um, as, a, as an Army site, they certainly don't want any information shared with the public until they want it to happen. So protecting their data and their information is key. Uh, they certainly don't want their data intermingled with other consumers. Okay. The next scenario we came up with was, what if the utility actually resides on the Army base? So are there any special requirements there? So example would be if a solar array or a wind farm is installed on the Army base. So we talked about, um, the North American Electric Reliability Council and their regulations, but these are very small installations, so they would not apply. So there's no protection requirement there. Um, they may need to connect to the base's network or their own devices, or maybe a database. Maybe the utility needs to have personnel that have physical access to the base, and they need to come in and work on the equipment. So now they have people coming into the base that are not base personnel to do this work. Um, so what we had to do was establish a risk-based cybersecurity requirements for the installation and look at these privately owned energy assets and to determine what would be the best fit for the Army in thinking about these things. So, so the approach we used was was to take that risk-based approach. And we narrowed it down to four areas that we wanted to focus on. So the first one was the loss or fluctuation of electrical power, which could result in brownouts, blackouts, or damage to the installation. So that would be the green box over there on the right. 
The next of the four we looked at was, could there be physical damage to the installation, such as fire or explosion? And that's the red box over there on the right. So physical damage to the installation. The third thing we looked at was direct or indirect connections between the energy system and the installation or the base. So could there be attack vector there for a cyber attack, either accidentally or intentionally? So that's the brown box over on the right, a direct or indirect connection. Um, and then the last one is theft or manipulation of data in order to monitor or jeopardize the installation or the operation. So that's the blue box there on the right. So then we developed what we call the risk profile. So if you see the table in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a risk profile showing those four colored boxes. And I realize it's, it's hard to read, but the columns are then um, a description of what could occur if it is a nominal, moderate, or high risk. And so we try to assess each installation and determine would one of these um, be a nominal, a moderate, or a high risk. And based on that, then, we come up with what we call our resulting risk rating. So you'll see the box in the lower right-hand corner with the colored columns. So those four risks and then um, the level that in this, this example, the risk rating was set at for each of those. So because of each installation has a specific mission and they may have different types of um, renewable energy and different connection methods, each site was initially evaluated individually to determine the resulting risk rating. And that was really the starting point for evaluating and selecting which uh, solution was pre presented by a contractor would be the best fit. Okay. The other thing we did when we were looking at requirements was what type of cybersecurity requirements are out there currently? So, here in the US, we typically use the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, which has developed many guidance. And uh, we identified that we wanted the did as well and implemented those as required by each site so so we took a lot of different things and really tried to simplify it. So here's, a, here's another approach to this, another picture. So we actually started building on work that occurred in 2009. The Department of Homeland Security had actually developed an initial document on cybersecurity procurement language 
procurement language. So in 2014, the Department of Energy was interested in what is, we built on that with the generally accepted guidance that provided by NIST and Department of Defense. And after several iterations, we came up with the final version that's currently being used by the Army in 2019, which is cybersecurity requirements for third party energy generating assets, which you'll see on the far right there. And that is what the Army used. So the current cybersecurity landscape was considered and included in the resulting cyber procurement clauses. We took a holistic approach. Um, and it provides a concise set of key requirements that tell the utility This example, we give six steps. I think they're all great, but they could pick and choose the ones they wanted based on the uniqueness of the installation. So in this case, they need to implement and maintain supply chain security program, establish, document, and implement the security risk management practices, specify how digital delivery for procured products will be validated and monitored, use trusted channels to ship critical energy delivery system hardware, implement a capability for detecting unauthorized access through the sixth step, which is to provide additional vetting of the processes and security practice. They have subcontractors. They're expected to be at the same high level. So in summary, I wanted to share with you some of the lessons we learned through this process, and I'm hoping that some will be useful for your work as well. So this has to do with the planning stage of a procurement life cycle. The number one thing we realized is we have to include planning. They need to help design the language for the request for bids or the proposals. Because on the other end, the contractors are going to have their cybersecurity people interpreting this as well. So we need to speak their language. We need to establish and adhere to cybersecurity evaluation criteria. So we need a consistent rubric by which to evaluate all the bids, but they need to have cybersecurity included in the evaluation process as well. We also need to include cybersecurity people in the review and selection too. It can't just be contracts personnel that make the selection. We need to include subject matter experts. And we need to include cybersecurity requirements in all the contracts and agreements to protect you, the consumer, from cybersecurity risk from third parties of the systems installed at your site. So some lessons from the contract award phase that you might find useful is including the topic of cybersecurity in conversations with the vendors and stress its importance. We actually visited sites with the vendors and talked to them and brought cybersecurity professionals along with the contracts people. So cyber people could talk to cyber people and they could speak the same language. And also to stress to the, the possible vendors how important this was. This was not something that was a simply the check the box exercise. This was something we expected throughout the life cycle. We would also want that the um, that we'd have cybersecurity experts assigned for the life of the project. 
So remember that these could be 20 or 30 year long projects. So that means it's going to have to be passed possibly from cybersecurity person to cybersecurity person throughout the life cycle of this installation. So, and review and providing feedback on the vendor's cybersecurity program and how it extends to your systems. So most companies do have a cybersecurity program for their corporate or business networks, but how many look at it into their operational or industrial control systems networks? If they're providers of those services, are they providing cybersecurity as part of their cybersecurity program to those capabilities as well? So we rec highly recommend that there's a cybersecurity program and a cybersecurity plan and that those are reviewed regularly by a cybersecurity person uh, that can ask probing questions, the exceptions that not every security control can be implemented for whatever reason. That's okay. We just need to have a mitigating approach. What will we do as a security control instead to protect those systems? Um, so I think we talked about already, it's important that most have a corporate security program, but how will they protect you as the consumer or you as the receiver of those services? Those, that's where it's very important to consider uh, your protection. We also wanna ensure that cybersecurity experts are included in the design and installation of the system. Um, my experience there was they weren't, the those that de designed the systems had a way they did it. It was often how they'd always been doing it. And when we asked to include cyber people, they were often confused about what value that could add. Uh, and so it was an educational process on both sides, understanding how the design and development of the system occurred, but also could we make it safer from a digital perspective? Often safety is included uh, from the perspective of protection of, um, of humans and the physical installation, but we also wanted to protect the digital asset itself uh, and the data of the system. And then also ensuring that their cybersecurity extends to the subcontractors as well. It's not just uh, to the prime contractor. Many contractors have subcontractors uh, and providers and, and vendors that they receive services from. So ensuring that this approach extends all the way through the contract to all the um, participating parties. And then finally, the contract management itself. Remember, this contract is gonna last a long, long time. It could last 30 years. So how do we ensure that there's continuity from the cybersecurity people that helped implement this to those that are going to maintain it. So we need to have a process on, on our side to do that. We also like to have a, a third party do an evaluation of the installed system annually. Somebody who can look at it and bring a fresh set of eyes and be sure that we're doing everything to keep it safe. Um, requiring reporting of cyber weaknesses. So, have some clause in your contract that requires that they report
Um, once the report is made and what type of remediation to it recover from the attack is expected. So these are important things to be thinking about before the contract goes in. Just going through a checklist and checking a box that we did cyber is not as important as continuously monitoring and ensuring that the cybersecurity is being kept up to date and monitored and acted upon. So it's easy to fall into a compliance um, mindset when really we need to stay with a continuous monitoring and improvement mindset when it comes to cyber. Um, don't let vendors charge you for cybersecurity when you buy part of the contract itself, not as a luxury item. And then finally, ensuring that your cyber, all cyber related reporting is reviewed by cybersecurity experts, not just contract staff. I was on a project where the contracts people reviewed everything that was in the contract, such as the cybersecurity plan, um, reporting, the annual assessment, and they received them, they checked them, and they paid the vendor. No subject matter and in the life cycle of the contract itself. And thank you for your time today. I appreciate you listening to me talk about the cybersecurity process of, um, in the procurement process. And um, at the very last slide, I, as promised, I had a list of resources of work, documenting the work we have done along with the NIST documentation as well. Thank you very much for your time today. <coughs>no, no, no, o sea, tengo que... Bueno, es, con esto cerramos la conferencia de hoy. Fueron cuatro charlas muy interesantes. Espero que hayan podido hacer todas las preguntas que hayan tenido. Oh, perdón. Estoy, sí, tuve un problema ahí. Eh, queremos hacerle recuerdo de que esta fue la última conferencia de 8.8 del año 2021, pero obviamente volvemos el próximo año con un montón de actividades. Así que atento a nuestras redes, atento a nuestra página web. Y bueno, quiero comentar que tenemos una tienda donde vendemos libros de ciberseguridad y también las poleras de, de todas las 8 que, que tenemos en stock. Así que le invito a, a, a revisar la tienda. El link está en nuestra web. Y también pueden ver todas las charlas de las conferencias anteriores en nuestro canal de YouTube. Así que los dejo súper invitados a revisar todo el material que hay y súper invitados a seguir con nosotros el próximo año.